thank you for letting us come back. It's great to see you all. We're excited to get reacquainted a little bit. And um, Gwen's going to make lunch here in a few minutes, and you all just come on to the house. <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> You can come, but just let us know you're coming. <laughs> Please tell me that Pastor Tabor has not been preaching through Genesis. No. <laughs> you know the purpose of a guest preacher. The guest preacher is to make the pastor look good, okay? So I'm going to do that. So when he come, when you see him next week, you pat him on the back and you tell him, Pastor, we are so glad that you're back. <laughs> let, us, let us tell you how bad it was. Well, I want to talk about wives today. I might have a surprise or two for you. So please look, at me, look with me at the... The, the book of Genesis chapter 2, the gospel of Genesis chapter 2, and we'll begin reading at verse 4. This is the word of God, inspired, infallible, without error. When your Bible is open, God is speaking to you. These words are inspired words. These words are enduring in authority because the very Spirit of God caused them to be. Because they are inspired, they speak to us still. This book knows us, understands us, what we're about to read was written perhaps 4,000 years ago, and it will still live in your heart if by the Spirit of God you submit to His Word and receive it. The most important thing we do in worship is to hear God speak. It's why we came here. It's why we keep coming here. So hear the word of God in Genesis chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. And then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold and the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, 
it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper for him, fit for him. I will make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and we're not ashamed. May the Lord bless the reading of and the hearing of his word. Now I assure you, I believe that, the, that God created the world in six days by the word of his power. But I'm not sure how to harmonize this this explanation of the creation of woman. So that's all I'm going to say about that. The second chapter of Genesis does not seem to fit harmoniously exactly with chapter one. And I think what 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 is happening here is there's not There is not two creation stories. There's not a contradiction. There's not a a gap. There's not whatever. There, There is one story of creation and God created the world in six days by the word of his power. But for God to do that is very complex. Very complex. Now, you all are not old enough to remember microfiche readers, okay? I'm an old guy, and I used to go to the library, and once in a while I would look up something on a microfiche. And so it was a little plastic, it was a little clear plastic um, uh, card. And on that card would, were little black squares or rectangles, and you would put that, that card into a reader. A big, it was a fancy magnifying glass, and, and you would, you'd, ro- you'd roll the handle around, and pages of newspapers or pages of old books would come up big, and you could read them. And by that, libraries were going to save space. They were going to have access to millions and millions and millions of books and newspapers and journals, and they would have them on little cards. I think what happened when when Moses was, was writing God's description of the creation was that God allowed him to roll a microfiche reader, a magnifying glass, back over a couple of verses of, of Genesis 1, and all these details began to come out. And the detail that we read in chapter 2 is that God knew what he was doing about developing the earth and he wanted to commission a man and a woman to develop the earth and the cosmos. Several places here, uh, um, uh, it, it talks about the place that Adam is going to have and the way God is going to to use him. Um, In verse 7, it talks about the creation of man. God formed the man out of dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and man became a living creature. Boom. Okay. And then the next verse tells us God had planted a garden, and he put the man there that he had formed. And then he tells us that that the plants have not sprung into full growth because God has been waiting for the man that would cultivate the garden. Okay, and tells us, the scripture tells us uh, in um, 
I've lost my place, I'm sorry. But it tells us that God wanted the man, uh, uh, in verse 5, he, he wanted the man to work the ground. That was going to be his task, to work the ground. And then he tells us again that um, in verse 15, that the Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Okay, so that's the concept of cultivation, right? Adam had to be a brilliant man. He had to be an inventive, creative, original thinker. Adam is put into Eden, and he's got to figure out what he can do. And he's got to have the kind of personality that he's happy about it. He's not, he's not afraid. He's not intimidated. He's not hesitant. He's, he's, a, he's a child in an incredible adventure. He's got to be able to learn by discovery. He's not going to be able to just take a few things he knows, but he's going to have to be constantly discovering more and more. He doesn't have anything to use. He's got to figure out how to use what's there. What an incredible mind and imagination and personality of powerful adventure he must have been. You know from Genesis 1, over and over, after, at the end of every day, God says, and it was good. And it was good. And it was good. And so it's a little shocking. Here in verse 18, when the Lord said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him, compatible for him. like him it's not good for the man to be alone I don't know what's so bad about being alone it's kind of nice to be alone sometimes Exodus look at Exodus verse chapter 18 here's an example of, of something that helps us understand why it's not good to be alone Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. Now you know this story. This is where Moses is, has brought the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. He's back into the, the Sinai wilderness. And, and he meets his father-in-law, Jethro. And uh, he's excited to tell Jethro all the marvelous things that God has done to deliver his people. Well, you know, they have... They have supper together, and Jethro stays in the, in the father-in-law, mother-in-law suite over the garage. And then the next morning, they get up, and Jethro watches Moses at work. Verse 13. Exodus 18, verse 13. The next day, Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, what is this that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone? Hear it? See, there's the word. Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another. I make them know the statutes of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. What you are doing is not good. Verse 18, here it is. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out. For the thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Well, I think that's pertinent. I think that's helpful. I think that illuminates something of what God was saying. It's not good for Adam to be alone because there's too much work for him to do alone. You know what a combat multiplier is. A combat multiplier is some pogue or some staff person or 
some truck driver or some, some warehouseman that enables the troops to carry on the fight to the enemy while they're in the back, they're in the rear, bringing beans and bullets to the front so that the warriors can fight. The warriors can't run down to the warehouse and bring back what they need. They need support. They need people to support them. So part of what God is saying to Adam is you need a support. You need a force that's powerful behind you to get all this done. I like, the, I like to think about creation. I like to think about what God was doing and I like to think about how it works and, and what the world must have been like before sin came into the world. You know, Adam, the things that Adam was coming up with, we're still, we're still doing. You know, and I like that. I like the concept of cultivation, you know. Cultivation means development, uh, production, expansion. You know, we talk about, we talk about, my dad worked for Chevron Oil Company and, uh, uh, you, the the gasoline would the, the the gasoline would come into the tank farm and and the 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 company called the gasoline product product but if you go out to the oil well if you go out to the oil well what's coming out of the ground they call crude and in order to get the crude turned into product, it goes through a process of refinement. Adam's in a world where he can take what is crude and figure out how to refine it into marvelous products that fuel and lead to incredible things. But he needs a helper. He needs somebody to help him. Let me say one more word about alone. Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Now, now Ecclesiastes is, is real close behind Psalms and Proverbs. Not too far. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. No, I'm sorry, chapter 4. Pardon me. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Duh. Now let me read verses 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. And woe to him who is alone when he falls. Woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they can keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. You understand those illustrations, illustrations of partnership, illustrations of companionship, illustrations of unity and, and uh, um, uh, team uh, uh, membership. The writer of Ecclesiastes, the preacher says, it's good to have a teammate if you fall down. I'm getting older, and when I, I do fall down sometimes, and it isn't, it isn't so easy to get up. I have to have people pull me up. And then he says, when you're cold, you can, you can spoon and get warm together. And then he says, if you're in combat, the third illustration is a combat illustration, that if you have a battle buddy and if you're fighting alone, you know, if you're Mel Gibson in some Hollywood movie, then you can fight off hundreds single-handedly, but that doesn't really, that's not really real. If you have a battle buddy and you're faced with an with a opponent, together you are going to be stronger and better able to ward him off or to defeat that enemy. 
So these, these illustrations of being alone would apply to Adam, I think, that he needs a companion, he needs a partner, he needs a wife, and she will help him. Now the word help, the word help is a word that is used really only in two ways throughout the Old Testament. To the word help is descriptive of God himself. So I think that what Moses is writing to us, what God is saying about woman, is that she has um, uh, a function in the world that reflects the reality of what God does and is. God is our very present help. The Psalms, are, is, it's easy to illustrate this from Psalms. The help, Psalm, Psalm 10, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 22, you know, from Christ's crucifixion. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? The, the spirit of Psalms over and over is, is, is heard in crying out to God for help. Help me. You know, that's a good prayer to pray. Help. God likes that prayer. There's another prayer I think God likes, and, and it's what did I do wrong? I think he likes to answer that prayer. But, but, you know, for what that's worth, no, no extra charge there. <laughs> Psalm 22, oh my strength, hasten, help me. Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I'm helped. Psalm 30, hear, O oh Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You know, I can go on and on. So Adam needs a helper. He needs the work of God in his life. Yeah, I'm sure Adam was pretty excited about that. Yeah, I'm going to get a helper. I'm going to get a wife, a woman. I wonder what she's like. It had to be great. And so then God made him wait. God put him to work. God said, go name the animals. Huh? Go name the animals. Not name all the animals, but name the large animals of the field and the birds. Animals that were made out of the soil like Adam was. And that's going to demonstrate that Adam is no mere animal. Adam is, is different from all the animals. Now, I told you, I believe that the world was created in six days by the word of God's power, okay? But, but here we are. Here we are in verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man named game, get na sorry. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. Most commentators will pass over this very quickly that Adam goes out and, and they, they describe this as a simple thing. There's a very, you know, that's a, that's a silverback gorilla and that's a, that's a rhinoceros and that's a, that's a duckbill platypus and that's a, that's a dodo bird. I think it's complicated. I think it was work. I think it took days and maybe months and maybe a year or more for Adam to do this work. Now this is the John MacArthur Study Bible notes, okay? I read something years ago. I couldn't tell you where I read it. And I'm giving him credit right now, whoever he is. But I read something that said that to name something is to identify its purpose. Naming is not in Nania. It's not inane to make up names. You can have fun that way. But to name something is to figure out what, what, what's it used for. You're walking up and down the supermarket and you're looking at names. Coffee creamer. 
instant powdered milk, one minute grits. The names tell you what these things are. They identify the purpose. Okay, John MacArthur's study Bible says, you know, in terms of verse 20, he gave names to the animals. It says, I need a magnifying, where's the microfish reader? He says, naming is an act of discerning something about the creature as to its appropriately excuse me, as to its appropriate identity. It is also an act of leadership or authority over that which was named. There is no, there is no, uh, there is no kinship with any animal since none was a fitting companion for Adam. Okay, so Adam is looking for his wife. He's going all over the region looking for that wife and she's not there but he's also having to identify the animals this is a horse what do you do with the horse he's got can you see Adam trying to train the first horse can you see Adam trying to corral and work with the first horse that's what I think is going on there I think Adam is figuring out this is a this is a beast of burden it's also a beast that I can travel with that, that can transport me. And it's also an animal that can draft, that can pull a load. Now we've got carpenters, horses, sawhorses. Now we've got the gymnastic horse. Now we've got the, the cowboys and the Indians talking about the iron horse and those, those Marines in tanks. No longer, no longer do they have their tanks, but their tank was the iron horse. A word, a word is a powerful thing that enables you to use it. It isn't just, you know, there's no leisure in the Garden of Eden. There's no, God doesn't wind Adam up and turn him loose and, and, and the guy hangs around sitting under a coconut tree until he gets bored and has to say, well, I guess I ought to do something. No, there's none of that. God says to Adam, this is my garden. Work it and protect it, keep it. So he's excited. He's excited to be alive. And Eve is a big part of that. Eve is a big contributor to that. She's got to be smart. She's got to be alert. She's got to be strong. Because not only does she have to work with the creation, she's got to work with Adam. <laughs> This wife is like an executive assistant to a general or an admiral or a, a high-ranking official. She's got to be his counselor. She's got to be his, uh, his sounding board. She's got to be his compass in so many ways. She isn't given a menial job. She isn't, she isn't, uh, she isn't uh, reduced to something ignoble. You know, there really, there really are three, two or three very helpful verses in Scripture that talk about how to live with a wife. We, we read Ephesians 5. Let's read, let's read one more verse. One, one, I mean, one more time. Let's go back to Ephesians 5 real quick. I'm only going to preach one time. You know, I can preach a long one here, and you guys can, you guys can go on and go to sleep, or, or you can go home, but I'm going to finish this. <clears throat> It says in verse 25, Ephesians 5:25, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? He loved the church by being unselfish. When Jesus commands disciples to follow, the first thing he says, whoever wants to come after me and be my disciple must deny himself. 
Men are selfish. Men are self-seeking. You know, men don't want the wife to talk. I get, I'm listening to my dear bride and I'm, I'm feeling my emotions rise because I'm not necessarily ready to hear the wisdom that I'm about to receive. I'm resistant. I'm self-seeking. I'm convinced I'm the smartest person in the room. It's not true. Christ loved us by not demanding his rights. Christ loved us in all of our um, trouble. He put up with us and he, and, and he fa stayed faithful to us through difficulty. He should, every time Jesus turned around the corner, the Marine band should have been there playing uh, Hail to the Chief, but he was not honored. And he made himself a servant. A husband must love his wife like Christ. A husband must serve his wife. A husband must put aside his selfishness and he must listen attentively and receptively. See, ladies, I'm talking to the talk, talking about wives. I'm talking about wives by talking about husbands. Get it? They don't. They don't pick it up. They don't understand that. They think I'm just talking to wives. It's okay. If you don't have a loving home, gentlemen, if there is a problem of love in your home, gentlemen, this scripture says the responsibility is yours. The responsibility of the husband is love in the home. It is your responsibility to build your home into conformity to God's blueprint. And the Christian home is just about eradicated from the planet. It's in trouble. It's an endangered species. And that's because men are not reading the Bible and they're not thinking how to take the Bible back home into the kitchen, into the living room. First Peter, chapter three. First Peter, chapter three, verse seven. First Peter three, seven. Likewise, husbands. Live with your wives in an understanding way. How do you do that? Well, just read the verse. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Not as the inferior vessel, not as the, not as the, the, the uh, sub, not, not, not the vessel with le le lesser value, but as the more valuable, as the more expensive vessel. Showing her honor. Since she is sent, show, show, I'm sorry, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. There's something very spiritual about the relationship of husband and wife, so that if he's not honoring her, if he's not respecting her, if he's not caring for her appropriately, it, in, it, in, it impacts the man's relationship with God so that his prayers are not getting to the throne. God gave you a wife so that you would hear her Respect her. Honor her. Her place, if you love her like Christ, her place in your home is so precious, so vital, so important, so great. I love the story of Genesis chapter 2. I love it because Eve was... Incredible. 
Adam has been knocking himself out trying to figure out the difference between a silverback gorilla and a chimpanzee, and he's worn out. He's worn out. So that when the woman is finally given to him, I, I just think God is delighted. I think God is delighted to bring this treasure to Adam. God gives us great gifts. You can take advantage. You can take for granted his gifts. But when God wants you to appreciate a gift, it really it works out well when it's like this, when you have to wait for it, when you have to sweat for it, when you have to search for it, when you have to hope for it, wish for it, lay awake at night thinking, what's it going to be like? And then she comes. I mean, I just, I just think God is just... Just, he's just got to be having fun in doing this. Puts Adam to sleep, creates the woman, and he gives her to Adam. You know, my, my, Hebrew, translation, my, my, my Hebrew translation skills are gone. I've lost them. They're, they're just no more. But I understand what this expression is. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. I mean, we, we can translate that in, into English by saying something like, hot diggity dog. <laughs> He's ecstatic. It's wonderful. See? And that's why Peter and Paul talk about marriage as respecting your wife, treasuring your wife, valuing your wife, uh, 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 cooperating with your wife. Your wife is a gift from God. What can I do to honor my wife? I meet with a, I, w I meet with a couple of men on Tuesday mornings. We share, we share things we're just having, reading in our devotional life. And, and, and one of those men, a week or two ago, he told me that he was listening to Christian radio, and, and whoever was on the radio made this remark. They said, um, they, they encourage that husbands start keeping a journal of things they're grateful for in regard to their wife. Keep a journal. Well, I thought that was great. I stole that idea real quick. But it's not easy. It's not easy to do. Just to go through the day, and at the end of the day, think, now what has Gwen done today that I can be grateful for or I should be grateful for? What has she done in my life that I should recognize? What has she done that has made me closer to the Lord? What has she done that has helped me? And so by doing that kind of thing, I'm trying to learn how to appreciate her, how to value her, how to show her honor inside my own thinking sincerely so that I'll show her honor externally sincerely. God gave you, gents, God gave you quite a gift. Quite a gift. She talks back to you. She won't let you cut corners. She doesn't just pat you on the back and say, yes, honey, whatever makes you happy. She doesn't do that because she's a godly woman. She's a good, good woman. A good gift. Our Father in heaven, thank you for the home we're in, we in this country have lost the Christian home. Please restore our homes. Please build us up in obedience to your word that we may be conformed to Christ and be able to love one another like Christ loved the church and to show honor to our wives so that we could really pray and commune with you and understand what your will is for our lives and our country and our homes. These things we ask in Jesus' name so that you would have honor and glory. In your name, amen.